back to the Peterson Institute for International Economics for what will be our final public program of the calendar year. Uh, we are facing a bit of an uphill battle on a holiday Friday, but in substance we are all in. Um, we have had a long time working relationship with the Korea Institute for International Economic Policy, KIEP, as well as more broadly doing, I think I can safely say, more work on the Korean economy and Korean international economic relations than any institute that doesn't have the word Korea in its name. Um, obviously, by our uh, Executive Vice President Director of Studies, Marcus Nolan, has done groundbreaking work on potential Korean unification, Korean reform, North Korean issues. Um, we have, of course, with us today as our main speaker, Senior Fellow Jeffrey Schott, who uh, I'm not very good on relations terms, but I think could be called the uh, beneficent uncle of the Korea-U.S. free trade agreement. Um, and he and his colleagues here on our trade team have d did all the groundwork for that critical agreement. Of course, in the years since CHORUS has been signed, let alone since Jeff and colleagues conceived of it, Korea has taken a, its own global role forward, having to think about how it relates with its neighbors, Japan and China, as well as the implementation of the U.S. agreement and of increasing salience to them in recent months, what happens in a world in which TPP, an extremely high standard agreement, goes forward as we certainly hope it will. In this context, Korea and China have pursued a new free trade agreement. We are releasing today a new policy brief by Jeff Schott, Eugen, Eugen Jung, and Kathleen Chimino Isaacs uh, discussing this in some detail. It is, of course, of interest deeply to the people of Korea, the people in the U.S. who are involved with Korea, but also involved with China, but also, most importantly, I think in some ways, as about how one adapts bilateral agreements in a world of increasingly high standard regional agreements. And this is something of general interest for Asian development and for trade policy. Uh, Jeff Schott, of course, has been a senior fellow at the Institute since 1983. He's the author of a huge number of studies, particularly on bilateral and regional trade deals, on the WTO, on the economic integration in the U.S., I mean, in the Americas, excuse me, and in Asia. And he and Gary Huffbauer, of course, have done the definitive work on economic sanctions. Um, working with him on this project, along with a lot of our other trade work, is Kathleen Chimino Isaacs, who is a research associate and who runs our trade outreach and education. Uh, she edits the Trade Pol Watch or Trade Policy blog on the Institute's website, which I hope you're all following. And Eugene Young is a research analyst who joined us recently. Um, this year and has been full on into the, the niceties and not so niceties of the Korea-China Free Trade Agreement. We have with us today our friend Chun Chul from Kiep, who will offer some remarks following Jeff's initial presentation and then we'll have discussion with the audience. Jeff, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Adam. Uh, I, the, uh, with all the intense focus on the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, it's easy to overlook other developments in the Asia-Pacific region that could have a, a marked impact on trade and investment. Uh, uh, that's why we undertook a study of the Korea-China Free Trade Agreement, uh, an initiative involving two of the world's leading trading nations that had the potential to bolster regional integration both within Asia and uh, across the Asia Pacific. Uh, as Adam said, it has important or it could have important precedents uh, for uh, ongoing integration initiatives and deserved attention both because of the importance of the bilateral relationship but more broadly because of its implications uh, for regional developments. Uh, 
And like uh, Adam, I want to extend my thanks uh, to Kathleen Chimino Isaacs and Jin Jung. Uh, they did the hard work uh, of researching and following this, uh, 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 this uh, negotiation as it was concluding uh, and uh, correcting all of the mistakes that I made so that we would have uh, a good product to present to you today. Uh, so what I'd like to do in a few minutes is just explain uh, some of the highlights of the agreement and its important implications. Now, this is not a, a new initiative. Uh, the Korea-China talks have had a long gestation period. Uh, like most initiatives in the Asia-Pacific uh, uh, region or within Asia, uh, talks usually start are preceded by feasibility studies both by government uh, officials and uh, by academia long before the official launch of trade negotiations. Uh, these talks started in May of 2012, just as trilateral negotiations uh, on an investment pact between China, uh, Korea, and Japan uh, concluded. Uh, the trade negotiations finished uh, just over a year ago, uh, were signed in June of this year, after a lot of technical and not so technical corrections. Uh, and uh, the agreement was ratified by the National Assembly on November 30th and enters into force uh, uh, later this month on December 20th. So uh, this is something that's going to have an impact soon, sooner than many people thought. Uh, and uh, it is uh, 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 going to influence uh, U.S. and other uh, trade and investment in the region starting in 2016. Uh, as, uh, as I said, it, it complements uh, existing economic relations between Korea and China. There is a bilateral investment treaty uh, that is longstanding, uh, as well as the trilateral investment pact uh, of a few years ago that uh, essentially updated the bilateral pact that was uh, negotiated several decades ago. Uh, it's important for bilateral uh, relations uh, between Korea and China and will influence the course of inter-Asian and Asia-Pacific integration going forward. Uh, in part, uh, it, it can be seen as a culmination of a decade of intensive negotiations linking Korea with most of its top trading partners with only bilateral talks with Japan left unfinished, and I'll talk about that in a, in, a, in a few moments. Now this just uh, gives a, 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 a quick overview of Korea-China trade and investment and shows why this agreement has become increasingly important. <clears throat> if you look back to the year 2000, uh, there was very little trade and almost no investment, though the investment data really isn't available until a few years after that. Uh, but two-way trade in goods grew almost eightfold between 2000 and 2014. Uh, and total trade is now uh, over $235 billion a year uh, in merchandise and another $36 billion in services. Uh, and indeed, the services trade has also grown very substantially uh, over this period of time, uh, thanks in part to sharp increases in Chinese tourism in Korea. I think if you go to Korea, you will, you will see it's hard to get into shops anymore because there's a long line of Chinese tourists uh, waiting in line to get in the front door. Uh, but there is this dramatic increase in, uh, <coughs> uh, in trade and uh, as well as in investment, though again from very, very low base and uh, much more Korean investment in China than Chinese investment in Korea. Now, why is this important, uh, uh, this deal important for Korea? Uh, it's because while there has been this sharp growth uh, in trade over a 15 year period, in recent years, as has occurred with world trade more generally, growth has slowed and China's share of Korea's global trade has hovered around 21% since 2007. In fact, if I go back to the figures, you can see that uh, uh, China had a 9% share of total uh, Korean merchandise trade back in 2000. It grew to 21 
Uh, and indeed, if you look at uh, the U.S. trade figures, which we discussed in an earlier session uh, this year, U.S. figures were about the reverse. Uh, U.S. Had the, was the principal trading partner in the year 2000, and it's dropped down to uh, uh, almost single digits, uh, just over uh, about 10 or 11 percent in, uh, uh, in, in current trade. Uh, so there has been this, this great shift in, uh, in the pattern and the share of, of uh, Korea's trade with the United States, Japan, Europe, and China. Uh, but even trade with China uh, has remained steady at around 20, 21 percent for quite a number of years. And so this was meant to, to give a boost uh, to important trade relations that had potential for growing even more. Uh, there's also important in growing the services trade, which has grown a lot, but is still at very low levels. Uh, and here, there are many non-tariff barriers that remain that obstruct uh, access to each market. Um, uh, if you look at the OECD's uh, services trade restrictiveness index, uh, which t uh, tries to gauge the level of restrictions in each market by, uh, uh, by sector and then compiles an aggregate, uh, the aggregate number for, for China is 36.6, where the higher the number, the more restrictive uh, on a scale of 1 to 100. And uh, Korea's uh, uh, overall uh, index is 23.1, so much less restrictive than China, but still with significant restrictions. Uh, by comparison, the U.S. Uh, overall restrictiveness index is 17.7, and, uh, but with wide uh, variation between the various sectors, because many areas were open, some areas we have legislatively mandated restrictions. Uh, in addition, as I, as I showed before on the investment numbers, uh, though China has become the second largest recipient of Korea's FDI abroad, Korean investments are still affected by performance requirements and other types of exceptions to national treatment. So investment promotion and investment protection are important considerations going beyond the Trilateral Investment Pact and trying to improve upon the Trilateral Investment Pact that was negotiated and entered into force in 2014. Uh, indeed, uh, trying to get TPP-like investment uh, uh, protections would have been very uh, important for uh, Korea that hasn't occurred at this stage of the negotiations. And finally, uh, and importantly for both economic and perhaps even more importantly for strategic uh, reasons, uh, uh, the uh, agreement was uh, meant to enhance economic cooperation regarding trade and investment in outward processing zones. And here the agreement differs quite substantially from the Korea-US Free Trade Agreement, uh, which basically excluded uh, production in the Quezon uh, industrial complex. Here, the intention is to try to expand trade and investment uh, by both Korea and China in those uh, outward processing zones, and I'll talk more about that in a moment. Those were the ambitions. Now, this is the results in terms of the tariff schedule. Uh, and as you will see here, uh, there is uh, different ways to, uh, to look at, this, uh, uh, at these results. If you just look at the final result and say, well, after 20 years, uh, we have substantial uh, liberalization uh, of, of most products, uh, and uh, uh, therefore, in both China and Korea, we'll do a lot. Uh, you can say, well, that's a good result. Uh, but if you're a businessman and you're looking at a 20-year horizon where a lot of the uh, liberalization is occurring between year 10 and 20 or even year 15 to 20, and a lot of important liberalization is excluded, uh, uh, and look at the exclusion totals, uh, uh, 8% uh, of the tariff lines for Korea, 9% by import value, and even more for China, 9% of the tariff lines and 15% of the import value. Then you can see that there are uh, uh, Im important limitations on the extent of the tariff uh, liberalization 
in this agreement. Uh, if you're a businessman, how much are you going to invest based on liberalization that supposedly or is promised to occur 20 years from now? Uh, less of an investment inducement or a less of an uh, uh, influence on current investment strategies for businesses uh, if you have this, back, this severe back-end loaded uh, liberalization. And uh, that's why I think while this agreement covers a large uh, volume of trade, uh, uh, that it, it is limited because uh, quite a bit of that trade uh, is not necessarily going to be affected in the immediate horizon relevant to international business. I'll talk more about this in, in, in a moment. In fact, maybe the best way to do it is to compare the liberalization schedules of the Korea-China uh, uh, Free Trade Agreement with that of the Korea-US and the Korea-European Union Free Trade Agreements, just to give the aggregates. And here, perhaps just focus on the 10-year or less, the middle column, uh, uh, on the on the uh, on the first on the left hand side, looking at the number of tariff lines, uh, though the figures are quite comparable in, by imports by value. After ten years, the Korea China Free Trade Agreement basically uh, uh, eliminates tariffs on seventy nine percent of Korean tariffs and seventy one percent of of Chinese tariff lines. Uh, that is not a large number. In fact it is smaller than the initial tariff cuts that, uh, that occur on day one in the US EU, uh, in the, in the Korea e, uh, US and the Korea EU uh, trade agreements. And compared to what the chorus and the uh, Korea EU deal does after 10 years, substantially less because almost all the tariffs are covered after 10 years. Uh, so there is a, 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 a big gap and even after, 10, uh, after 20 years, uh, where everything is almost, almost everything is covered in the U.S. and the EU deals, there's still almost 10 percent of the uh, tariff lines uh, that are uh, uh, exempt from liberalization uh, in the China-Korea deal. So uh, while very important, uh, there are lots of exceptions. Uh, uh, so in fact, if you, if you think about it, there are so many exceptions to FTA liberalization uh, just on the tariff lines that it could raise doubts about conformity uh, with the provisions of GATT Article 24 that allow exceptions to most favored nation treatment for regional trade agreements. Uh, but to have that type of uh, a case brought, uh, someone has to complain about it. Uh, and countries rarely complain about coverage of free trade agreements uh, for, because what I like to call uh, of the uh, glass house syndrome. Uh, everyone has uh, warts in their own free trade agreements. And so if you start throwing stones at somebody else's agreement, those stones will be thrown back at you and looking at uh, what you do in your own. Uh, so uh, uh, in particular, because this is an agreement between uh, a relatively advanced economy like Korea and a rapidly emerging but developing economy like China, uh, there, there are other uh, considerations uh, about the quality of the agreement that would make a case uh, difficult uh, to uh, uh, pursue uh, legally but even more so politically. Uh, and I doubt that a case will be brought against this agreement. Now in terms of the exceptions, Agriculture is, is prominent as it is in many or in most uh, free trade agreements. Agriculture accounts for uh, 581 of the 960 products excluded by Korea uh, or subject to partial reform. Uh, interestingly, a smaller share of China's exceptions are agriculture, only 102 of 766. Uh, that might tell you something and the next point tells you more. Major manufacturing products, autos and some key electronics, are excluded from tariff liberalization or have a long tariff phase out. Uh, that's particularly important for Korea in terms of its auto exports to, to China, uh, which are, are, are quite limited. And uh, uh, another, another consideration in this agreement is that uh, uh, 
uh, the currently uh, uh, almost concluded information technology agreement that is on the verge of, of acceptance uh, in the WTO, uh, hopefully uh, next week in, in Nairobi, uh, covers some Korean exports excluded from the FTA. So some of those exclusions in the IT sector will be covered by broader uh, global uh, most favored nation tariff reforms. Uh, uh, products like television cameras and receivers for televisions. Uh, but important Korean exports such as uh, uh, organic uh, light emitting uh, diode uh, uh, panels uh, for uh, TVs, uh, which are multi-billion dollar exports for Korea, uh, are still excluded both from the FTA and from the Information Technology Agreement. Now here with Marcus Nolan in the, in, uh, in the audience, I, I am careful to talk about uh, Kaesong Industrial Complex because he, he's the expert on, on, on uh, North-South Korean uh, economic relations. Uh, but it's worth noting the difference, as I mentioned before, between the, uh, uh, the exclusion of outward processing zones in uh, the, the Chorus FTA and the inclusion, deliberate inclusion in uh, in the Korea-China. Uh, unlike Chorus, about 310 products made in outward processing zones uh, will qualify for preferential treatment with liberal rule origin rules for goods produced in the uh, uh, OPZs. Uh, what this means in the short term is that South Korean manufacturers in, in the Kaesong Industrial Complex can expand their market to China uh, over the medium term, it's expected that there will be more Chinese uh, foreign direct investment in these zones, uh, which will reduce the business risks for South Korean firms associated uh, with their participation in, in these zones. And over the long term, it hopefully will uh, 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 spur deeper economic integration with North Korea that can pave the road towards reconciliation between the two Koreas. But that's a long-term vision and that requires a lot of change, both economically and politically. Now, trade agreements are not just about tariffs. And really, if you think about trade agreements in the 21st century, they're about investment. Uh, and so is services trade. It's a lot, of, uh, a lot about investment, because uh, a lot of services really are propelled by uh, uh, cross-border uh, in, in investment in each other's markets. Uh, and this is one area where the, uh, the Korea-China Free Trade Agreement gets an incomplete. Uh, indeed, if you had to mark the current uh, uh, accomplishments, uh, it, it's, it's, it's rather weak. Uh, Korea-China investment and service negotiations uh, on market access uh, issues, however, are scheduled to commence uh, within two years, and there has been an agreement that they will be based on a negative list approach, uh, which at least st uh, starts the negotiations on the right foot because it makes it harder uh, to, uh, to reduce the level of uh, liberalization without specifying and giving greater transparency to the areas that will be excluded from liberalization. Uh, and uh, so that's, that's a, a, uh, a positive uh, sign going forward, but not one that has yet been negotiated. Uh, what has been negotiated is an investment chapter that includes standard features such as national and MFN treatment. Uh, it includes investor state dispute settlement. Uh, there is uh, less, much less uh, 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 civic uh, concerns in China about investor state dispute settlement. That probably is not a surprise. Uh, but even in Korea, where those provisions caused uh, uh, some public debate, uh, some significant public debate in the context of the Korea-US free trade agreement, uh, these, these uh, uh, protections are included. And they're seen as a way of helping increase the uh, protections for, in Korean, for Korean investors in China. Uh, uh, but similar to the trilateral investment pact, uh, these provisions uh, do not apply to pre-investment phases of investment. Uh, 
but uh, that, again, is another uh, 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 change that will occur and an innovation that will be included in the second round negotiations on investment and services. Uh, for services, very little was done. Uh, though the FDA includes some liber limited liberalization for specific uh, uh, telecommunications, financial, and enter entertainment services. This is not a broad-scale liberalization of those sectors, but specified activities uh, that will have commercial benefit for a few firms in, in, uh, in a particular, particularly narrow field of, of, uh, of economic enterprise. Uh, Liberalization could expand both in the follow-up negotiations and uh, possibly in the plurilateral trade in, in services agreement uh, that is under negotiation. Korea is a party to it. China would like to be. Uh, it is currently blocked by the United States. Uh, and uh, we can talk more about that if, 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 if you like. Uh, but over the years, I, I would uh, 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 hope and expect that China would become a full member of the uh, TISA and expand its, uh, its scope of uh, services reforms both domestically and through international obligation. Uh, there are provisions for uh, uh, some uh, services with regard to a movement of labor, uh, in particular intracorporate transferees working in each country. Uh, visa provisions have been expanded uh, to three years. This is, seems like a small technical matter, but if you're conducting business in a country, uh, or even if you're the president of the Peterson Institute and trying to get into China, it's good to have easier access to, uh, to visas, and uh, uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is something that will, 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 will make life a little easier uh, to uh, pursue trade and investment between the two countries, because people will be able to move back and forth a little more. Uh, though I might add, that the, uh, the length of time accorded to Korean uh, businessmen in, in China is less than, uh, 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 than the length of time accorded Korean businessmen in the United States. So uh, there is still a, a watchful eye and some limitations on these, on these movements. Uh, there are a few other uh, aspects of the agreement that bear a very quick note. Uh, intellectual property rights uh, remain a concern for Korean businesses uh, in, in China, as they do for U.S. businesses. Uh, it's a particular concern for Korea uh, with regard to protection of audiovisual entertainment and media products. Uh, and uh, uh, there, were, there was limited scope for liberalization of the services, uh, but there's still concern about the protection of, uh, of intellectual property in those areas. Uh, more broadly, the, uh, the bilateral FTA upholds the uh, WTO uh, commitments on intellectual property in terms of extending copyrights and, and uh, preventing some circumvention of technological measures and, and calls for remedies for IP infringements, uh, though again, much less comprehensive and, and much less of a judicial process than the U.S. insists upon in its free trade agreements. There's also a chapter on environment, uh, which uh, is not surprising uh, because both Korea and China have recognized the importance of making strides in uh, mitigation of environmental degradation, uh, air pollution, uh, water, and the like. Uh, and uh, while this is not the greenest uh, uh, trade agreement that Korea has ever negotiated. Uh, it is important that there is a joint uh, un uh, a commitment by both countries uh, to do more in terms of environmental cooperation. Uh, it does not have enforcement provisions. Most agreements not involving the United States do not have enforcement provisions on environmental obligations. Uh, and there is no labor chapter, which again is not a surprise. Uh, any agreement with China does not uh, will probably not have any obligations on labor. Uh, and this is in stark contrast to recent Korean FTAs that all have had uh, uh, provisions that uh, inc uh, include real obligations on, on labor practices. I'm getting near to the end. Uh, uh, and 
but before concluding, I think it's important to note the implications for Asia-Pacific economic integration. And in the near term, at least, I see two limited outcomes, uh, but two clear implications uh, for economic integration uh, uh, in, in the region. The first is, is that the more limited results on the Korea-China free trade agreement will have uh, a, a uh, impact and, and a dampening effect on ambitions for the resolution and the conclusion of, of the trilateral China-Japan-Korea uh, free trade agreement. Uh, those talks have been underway uh, for several years. Uh, there have been more than eight rounds of negotiations. Uh, uh, but I think uh, that the results of the, those trilateral agreements, that uh, trilateral negotiations, if they reach conclusion, will probably not exceed that of the Korea-China deal, and in fact uh, could be even less ambitious. Uh, this also means that uh, prospects for the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, the RCEP, that involves the Northeast Asian countries as well as ASEAN and Australia and New Zealand and India, uh, the prospects for that deal, uh, which should have concluded, which was supposed to have concluded this year, but have been extended because they are far from the finish line, uh, those talks will probably be even less ambitious than the trilateral. Uh, if you think about it, the three Northeast Asian countries account for 70% of the combined GDP of the 16 countries of, uh, involved in the RCEP. Uh, and so this is going to, uh, uh, the, the, what they, they do among themselves is going to be probably more than can be accepted by the other 13 countries. And so the uh, prospects for RCEP have been de downgraded even more in economic terms, though it still has great importance for its impact on intra-ASEAN integration and for broader economic cooperation among the Asian countries. Uh, uh, second, lower expectations for the trilateral free trade agreement means that Korea and Japan need to strengthen their bilateral ties beyond the trilateral uh, talks and beyond the RCEP negotiations. And the best way for them to do so is by negotiating a deal in the context of the broader regional TPP. I think Korea has understood this for some time, but has hesitated to uh, uh, ask to join the, the TPP negotiations. As, as we've noted in previous uh, studies, we think uh, that this was a strategic mistake, uh, that Korea would have benefited uh, uh, more from being an original signatory uh, and would have had been in a better negotiating position to negotiate its terms of, of entry. Uh, but that's now water under the bridge. And as Korea uh, expands its comprehensive array of uh, trade initiatives and looks forward to uh, the next few years, I think more and more attention is being given to the fact that Korea probably uh, needs to be and probably will ask to be and probably already is at the front of the queue for countries seeking uh, future admission to the TPP. Uh, and uh, uh, that, of course, uh, assumes that the TPP will enter into force, uh, and that's a question for the U.S. Congress and uh, one that will be debated uh, very seriously next year here in Washington. So in conclusion... Uh, I think we can uh, uh, note that by completing FTAs with the United States, Europe, and now China, uh, Korea has reinforced its global FTA network. Uh, that's very important and has put Korea in the forefront of uh, trade negotiating uh, nations, one of the leading architects of the emerging new uh, uh, infrastructure from the world trading system. But it's important to note that these FTAs are not fully com comparable. The level of trade liberalization and the scope of new rulemaking, the new obligations on uh, trade policies uh, and uh, uh, domestic policies that have impacts on uh, trade and investment flows, uh, 
uh, those, uh, those uh, uh, rules are, are much less ambitious than uh, those that Korea negotiated in the agreements with the United States and the European Union. Uh, moreover, the, many of the reforms are back-end loaded, and there are key exceptions that dilute the PAC's stimulative effect on the Korean and Chinese economies. Now, the deal could be upgraded and hopefully will be upgraded after follow-up negotiations on services and investment later this decade. Uh, but uh, 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 that is hopeful, but uh, today and for the near term, the agreement does, does not set a very high bar for ongoing intra-Asian initiatives like RCEP and CGP. Uh, and so again, uh, I think the lesson here is the all of the above strategy move forward with amplifying the Korea-China free trade agreement is, is the right way to go uh, for both countries. Uh, but it also increases the importance of countries in the region looking at the TPP as a way of upgrading its level of uh, bilateral and regional uh, trade integration. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, the people who are with us today and the many more who are joining us online and will see the, the video um, over the long term, I think have to recognize one important thing that was implicit in Jeff's conclusion, but I, I bears conversation particularly in East Asia, that the U.S. and certainly we at the Peterson Institute believe there is no inherent conflict between TPP and Korea having its own active trade policy, and for that matter, China having its own active trade policy. Whether or not it all works out as ideally competitive liberalization in the sense that Fred Bergston has put forward, but which does seem, frankly, to be having some beneficial effects through TPP and APEC, it is not something that we view as a danger. At the same time, I think part of the message of Jeff and his co-authors' work is that for our friends in Korea, for our friends in, in Asia more broadly, one has to be honest about the shortfalls when doing low standard agreements and how much that is going to be out of step with the high standard agreements that are starting to emerge. And so I want to commend Jeff, Eugen, and Kathleen for making that case in very much detail, but also the broader point. I'd actually like to call on Dr. Chul Chung from KIEP. Uh, Chul is a partner of ours in substance as well as formal, uh, and he is director of the Asia Pacific Department at the Korea Institute for International Economic Policy and runs the Korea National Center for APEC Studies. He holds a PhD from the University of Michigan, and prior to joining KIEP in 2007, he taught at Georgia Tech. If you're willing to come up and just say a few words on your take on this issue, I'd appreciate it. Uh, thank you very much, Adam, and the, uh, the thank you, uh, Jeff, uh, Eugene, and uh, Kathleen for a comprehensive uh, assessment of the Korea-China FTA in detail. Um, I agree with the, the most of the, the Jeff's uh, presentation, but I'd like to uh, show my uh, a little bit the, the different view on the, the some part of the, the assessment of the, the Korea. China FTA. Um, I agree that the, the this Korea uh, China FTA is not at the level of the the Korea EU FTA or Korea US FTA, and the the numbers show that. But uh, in terms of the the China's FTA so far, it is the highest. The 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 Chinese I mean the standard. So it is not the, uh, the, uh, the intention for both China and Korea to make this FTA to be low standard. And um, also we have to consider that, I mean, we have to consider the fact that the, uh, the China is still a developing country, unlike US and EU, who are the, uh, the most advanced economies in the world. 
and so and also we often uh, forget about the uh, the importance of the time. I mean, when we actually uh, study economics in economic models, we enter this the uh, the time variable. I mean, the, the for the uh, discount factor. And the reason why I I raise this point is because of the the opportunity cost, the dead weight losses, because the deal is not. Uh, being implemented. So we have had this kind of experience in the case of Korea US FTA. After signing the, uh, the agreement in 2007, it took five years almost to go into entry. And uh, all the, uh, you know, the, 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 the costs that you know, uh, borne out by the, the delay, uh, we all know that the, the, these uh, businesses and the, the um, both Korea and U.S. might have lost. Um, and so, yeah, if we think back, maybe Korea and China could try more, but there could be some costs. I mean, we all know that the other, you know, when it goes to the other, there, we have to cons compare the other marginal benefits and the other marginal costs. How much the other benefits we could have done and how much the other cost we have to we had to uh, bear to achieve that much of the other uh, trade liberalization, and considering the uh, the fact that the the China is uh, moving slowly in terms of the, its reform inside the economy, considering the the western part of the the China, of course you know Shanghai might be the uh, very well advanced part, and. But if you go to the west of China, it's still very, uh, very much un undeveloped. And so I think the, uh, the uh, China-Korea FTA should be a good starting point uh, rather than a uh, constraint or limitation uh, for the, the China uh, CJK trilateral agreement. Um, because I think the, the CJK trilateral FTA can be a good upgrading opportunity for Ch Korea-China FTA. Uh, with the, the uh, leaders willing, I think the, um, we can the, the make this. I, I think the, the Korea-China FTA is the, the kind of the, the uh, lower bound. So I think the, the CJK can be uh, you know, better and the, the more you know, I have the other more optimistic view with Japan in TPP and Korea uh, willing to uh, join TPP uh, somewhat later. So I think the uh, the uh, cross FTA was the uh, the basis for TPP, and the uh, the Korea China FTA can be uh, the basis for the uh, the CJK and the uh, the RCEP in general. Of course, our set might not be as uh, high as the uh, TPP. We all know with the, uh, the India and uh, uh, the LDC countries like Cambodia, Laos, and Myanmar. And I'd like to add one more point about the, uh, the inclusion of the, uh, the Kaesong uh, outward uh, processing zone in Korea-China FTA is, has a very important significance uh, with the, uh, the ongoing One Belt, One Road initiative and AIIB uh, by China, I think the, the, in the future, this might have much bigger impact than the, the, we think right now. And the brighter part of the, the Korea-China FTA is that it is now, and the, it will be entered into force in 10 days, and after, you know, after 10 days later uh, from that, it will be also, I mean, there's going to be the, the tariff schedule, uh, the, the elimination, right, of the, the tariffs. So it will be twice in 10, 10 days. So uh, I know the, the TPP is the, the much higher, uh, and the, the, it, will, it will set the, the uh, global standard with the, the you know, high standard. Um, but at the same time, Korea-China FTA, as Jeff Oles and the, the Adam uh, put it, uh, you know, correctly, uh, is a good starting point for the, uh, the Asian uh, platform for the, uh, the any kind of the uh, economy integration. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Um, I, I just, again, it's not my job to be repetitive, but I want to thank Chol for making the link to the big picture issue of China's AIIB and One Belt, One Road. Uh, the Institute's doing a lot of work on both those issues, and like Chol envisions it and Kiev tries to do as well, our hope is to embed this in the broader issues of APEC and Asian, Asian economic integration. The cautions about timing and opportunity are the sorts of things that real world policy has to take into account, and I appreciate you giving us that perspective. I'd like to invite Jeff and Kathleen and Eugen to come up. Um, it it's, makes things look a little more formal, but as authors of such a serious study, they deserve their place in front. Um, and we'll open it up to questions from the floor. Uh, we have a mic right there in the center of things, if anyone would care to come up. Yes, thank you, Gary. Thanks very much um, for the great presentation and the good comments from Chul. Uh, I have um, kind of three very quick questions. Firstly, in Korea, were, were, did we see the same complaints about lack of transparency in these negotiations that we've heard so much about in, uh, in the U.S. over the TPP? Uh, secondly, I, I, I wouldn't expect any lack of any complaints in China, so let's just concentrate on, on Korea. Uh, se secondly, um, while there's a the provision that uh, was described for renegotiation expanded negotiation, what about expanded membership? Uh, could uh, the Korea China be just the docking point for Japan? I know the the uh, atmospherics of that might not suit Japan, but what about just kind of signing on? And then uh, more broadly, to pick up on Chul's point, what about using the um, the China-Korea agreement as the base for RCEP and really lifting RCEP up from the basement where it seems to be currently located. <laughs> well, Kathleen, do you want to grab one of those? Sure. I, I think, I mean, I would say for, um, in terms of the potential for Korea-China to be a sort of baseline. I guess I'll, I'll say for an expanded negotiation that the question related to that. Um, I, I don't, I didn't personally, I don't think there were any ascension criteria or any um, attention to that kind of um, expansion. I think though implicitly there was uh, an intention to see this as something for uh, the, the CJK talks and building from there. I think RCEP is the initiative that kind of is seen more as that ha having that expansive aspect to it. Um, so formally, no, I don't see um, sort of a provision for you know tagging on to the uh, the, the Korea China agreement. Um, but more broadly, I think, and kind of to reinforce Chul's uh, comments, I think um, using it as a base for RCEP is a, certainly a best case scenario. Um, whether that can happen with sort of the diverse membership is yet to be seen, but I think that's a positive um, outlook for it. Um, but just to reinforce, I think RCEP is, is seen as, as uh, having more capacity for that expansive, um, uh, that expansive capacity. Maybe Great. Jeff will add, add to that. Well, l let me, uh, if I can, ask, ask Jen, because she's been following the Korean participation in, in FTAs for a long time, about the public uh, perceptions, Gary's first question, about the transparency of negotiations. Has this elicited the types of reactions that people don't know and are concerned about the, uh, what is going on behind cl closed doors at the negotiating table, and then they raise those concerns in debates in the National Assembly? Uh, as far as I did research uh, the, during the negotiation, the information was, uh, as you, uh, as Jeff mentioned, was not uh, publicly available. But after the negotiation was signed, then the information was available for, for the public. But during the 
uh, National Assembly for ratification process uh, due to the other issues was more conflicting among the party members. So this ratification for the China-Korea FTA wasn't a big uh, causing big, uh, discussion or conflict among the uh, politics. So the, the transparency issue wasn't uh, very, um, transparency issue was, uh, was a uh, kind of concerning issue, but it was uh, overshadowed by the political issues in Korea. Thank you, Jim. Yeah. As, as, as far as uh, the uh, uh, expansion of the model uh, from the Korea-China Free Trade Agreement, I think Kathleen got it right. Uh, but it's interesting to note that during the negotiations, when I discussed the, these talks with Chinese economic officials, they thought that the Korea-China results would at best be the high water mark for what could be done in RCEP. Uh, and indeed, uh, as the talks uh, were, in, in my view, rushed to conclusion uh, last year to meet for political uh, uh, reasons, uh, that, that uh, meant that their, the Chinese perception of, of using the Korea-China uh, model was uh, going to be much less uh, useful in the, in the regional context. Now, Joel could be right. It could be uh, uh, the floor for ongoing trilateral negotiations. Uh, but I suspect that uh, the Japanese, in looking and seeing how the, the bilateral Korea-China talks progressed, <coughs> recognize that not only are, are they going to face the same type of obstacles in expanding trade in automobiles and other important uh, manufactured products in Japan and being forced to jump over high tariff walls, to invest uh, without perhaps adequate intellectual property protection or investor protection, that they uh, saw that evolving during the bilateral talks and that contributed to their uh, enthusiasm for uh, entering into the TPP. Uh, so I'm not sure that the, that the Japanese are putting the same uh, perspective on the future of expansion of uh, CJK that, that Joel said. But this is speculation. I, of course, would hope that Joel was right. Mm -hmm. Well, the two don't need to contradict. Yeah, please, Joel, if you could go to the microphone. Thank you. Um, uh, sorry to take the, the, the microphone again. Uh, but I'd like to uh, add a couple of points to, uh, to the, uh, the, the responses. Uh, to uh, Gary's question about the, the lack of transparency in Korea. Um, actually, the, the trade uh, moved from uh, MOFA to MOTI, meaning that the, the from the foreign affairs to uh, the uh, administration of the, the industry. So um, during the, the Korea-China FTA, actually there was a lot of the, the communication and, with, and consultation with the, the Korean industry. Uh, by the, uh, the Korean government officials more than in the past. So the transparency issue uh, has become not an issue uh, in Korea. Uh, rather, actually, the, the more concerns uh, by some other people were they're too, too, uh, uh, too much the, the linked to the, the industry, uh, maybe the, the, with some interests. So um, maybe the, the, that was... Uh, that was one. And the, the following up on the, the uh, Jeff uh, comments about the, the uh, you know, the, the CJK, I mean, the, the CJK trilateral and RCEP uh, for the, the Korea-China FTA. Um, last week in Seoul, actually, Jeff was participating in the, the conference. I was there, too. And the, the you know, uh, one uh, Chinese uh, scholar mentioned that the, the uh, economic integration is not all about the, the trade liberalization, and it's not all about the, the high standard. It is more about the, the economic cooperation, and, and that's what the, the China is uh, moving on with the, the One Belt, One Road, and AIIB, I believe. Um, here, I would say that the, the Korea-China FTA will not be an upper limit 
to um, CJK trilateral. I, I hope that, that that could be the uh, the the, uh, the lower uh, lower bound. And although I'm also the a little bit the the you know surprised in a sense that the the Korea China FTA uh, did not um, open much in terms of the the agriculture in Korea even after the the all this. Uh, openings to all this, the the Canada and many other countries. Um, so I I, uh, I I'm with the uh, Jeff on that. Maybe Japanese uh, Japan may not be willing to open the the agricultural market to China as much as in TPP. Maybe, and um, in turn that means that the the China will not open the the automobile market. You know the the to to Japan. Thank you for that perspective. Please, if you could come to the mic. Oh, oh thank you. Uh, my name is Don Kirk. I spent some time in Korea. I'm just wondering uh, if, if you could go a little bit more into the possible impact of uh, all this on China's relations with North Korea. We've mentioned Kaesong, but we haven't uh, mentioned uh, a whole lot of other issues and how that might contribute to the isolation of North Korea. And perhaps as sort of a related issue, this Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank uh, is a Chinese, obviously a Chinese thing, uh, which some people think might deepen differences between China and the US and China and Japan and so forth. Uh, I wonder if you could elaborate a little on, on that uh, and the prospects for FDA slash Asia AII, what is it, a AIIB, uh, Together, combining to uh, deepen the rift between uh, China and uh, and the U.S., there are implications also for the South China Sea. So, what, what will what will Korea be doing about uh, supporting some uh, Southeast Asian nations in the South China Sea? Probably nothing. But uh, you know, your comments would be most appreciated. Thank you. Well, uh, Don, those are two very broad questions, and I will give you two narrow answers uh, so that we don't... I, uh, I commend you for your restraint, Jeff. Thank uh, you. <laughs> uh, and uh, on, on the China-North Korea uh, 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 point, uh, of course, we have here at the Institute, Marcus Nolan, some of the most... Uh, groundbreaking work and analysis of, of, of that relationship and of North Korean economy. Uh, so I, I, uh, I encourage you to look at his work and, and his postings and studies on, on, our, on our website. Uh, but to just to repeat uh, what was said in the, in the presentation, there is the hope uh, that uh, increased Chinese investment uh, in outward processing zones in North Korea will, over time, create positive leverage on, on the regime. Now, Mark uh, is much more knowledgeable on this, so I won't go very much further on this. But that uh, is, is one of the reasons why there, there are these extensive provisions uh, uh, on outward processing zones uh, to, uh, uh, to look at the medium and long term possible positive implications on moving the North Korean uh, policy in a, in a positive direction. In terms of AIIB, again, uh, a very big topic and one that is going to be increasingly the subject of institute studies because of its broader implications for economic development in the region. Uh, I would just note one small point. Uh, this indicates, as well as uh, other uh, uh, initiatives that China is undertaking, China's increased interest in having new framework of rules on investment in the trading system because they are increasingly an important investor uh, and they want to make sure that uh, uh, they don't face the types of discriminations in particular markets uh, that could inhibit their, their opportunities uh, to grow in, in terms of regional and global uh, investment. Uh, one is seeing that already in the preparations for work that, that China is undertaking to chair the G20 in 2016. Actually, it's now in the chair uh, uh, this, as of this month. Uh, and, uh, and of course, China's interest in the China-US Bilateral Investment Treaty. 
Great. Thank you. Bear, are you looking to come? I wonder if you could uh, just could talk Could you about identify about yourself, please? Barry Wood, RTHK in Hong Kong. Uh, could you um, look at the broader implications of the likely delay of U.S. implementation of TPP? And further from the last question about the balance of China's relationship with North Korea and South, I, I, in that context, in jumping to South Korea, why would, do you think that Given the likely delay of implementation of TPP, South Korea, with already a FTA with the U.S., would want to join TPP. Well, well, Barry, uh, there are a lot of reasons why Korea should want to join TPP, uh, uh, even though it has chorus, uh, and we actually spelled that out in a in a, uh, in a paper we presented here uh, last September. Uh, so uh, let me not go into the detail uh, on that. Let me focus on, on implementation of TPP. Uh, perhaps your question was spurred by the headlines in the Washington Post this morning that said that uh, uh, Senator McConnell uh, suggested that TPP be delayed until after the election. Uh, and uh, that seemed to run 180 degrees counter to uh, what the Obama administration uh, and its officials are trying are saying about pushing for uh, a, a vote in the Congress by the middle of the year. I don't think, uh, as a practical matter, the two comments, which seemingly go in the opposite directions, are necessarily incompatible. What Senator McConnell is doing is playing high stakes poker, uh, uh, which is a game that is played every day in Washington. And uh, uh, clearly, it is in the interest of his constituents uh, to get the best uh, trade deal for the United States and to get uh, the uh, changes in US law and practice that will benefit his constituents that could Jeff, be a Jeff, party. why are you being so vague? You're not a member of the government. You're not a member of the party. Okay. McConnell's carrying water for his local tobacco companies. Can you please say that rather than saying his constituents? and giving it dignity is that it does not deserve? I really don't understand, Jeff. Okay. Okay, fair enough. Uh, you'd think after 30 years I would have forgotten that I was uh, no longer in government. That's Adam correct. That. Exactly right. Um, uh, the, I mean, both McConnell and Hatch uh, uh, have concerns with the tobacco and the pharmaceutical provisions of the TPP. They are engaged in private discussions with Obama administration officials on trying to get some resolution of their concerns, uh, either through renegotiation of the terms of the agreement, which is very difficult when you have 11 other partners and where, these, where at least the pharmaceutical issue was a hot button and, and red line issue for many of those countries. So uh, the way I would describe it is, if you try to renegotiate the pharmaceutical provisions of the TPP, it, is, it will be a poison pill for the entire agreement. Uh, uh, so they are trying to get changes in US uh, policies that affect the tobacco and pharmaceutical industries uh, uh, that will benefit their constituents through the implementing legislation for TPP. Because the implementing legislation not only ratifies the existing agreement, but makes changes in US policies to accommodate that agreement, both in uh, making sure we are uh, compatible, our laws are compatible and consistent with the obligations undertaken, and that the US industries and farmers are better positioned to, uh, uh, to compete and take advantage of the new opportunities created by the trade agreement. Uh, so they're trying to change and introduce those types of sweeteners into the domestic legislation that will help their constituents. That's part of the negotiation. That's also being done in Korea uh, with regard to agriculture. That's done, uh, being done in Japan with regard to agriculture and providing additional income support for farmers who will face more, more competition. Uh, and every country does that as part of the uh, uh, redistribution uh, of uh, government policies to support uh, a strategy of economic growth 
that can take advantage, better take advantage of the opportunities created by trade agreements. So that's what's happening. I think as long as there is a pragmatic interest in getting this done, because I think the Republicans recognize that uh, if they don't get it done this year, it, 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 uh, uh, the agreement will face perhaps a potential serious delay uh, at the start of a, a, a new administration, whoever is elected, uh, but also there's a risk of losing the Senate. So Senator McConnell, of all people, should be, uh, should be uh, aware that he may lose his very influential position if the, if the next election goes very badly for the Republicans because of the large number of Republican senators up for re-election uh, compared to a small number of Democrats. It's, it's viewed as an outside chance right now, uh, and it's a little early to predict uh, what will happen uh, in, the, in this very strange campaign. But uh, uh, if you have something of substance and value for your constituents, why throw it away? Uh, and I don't think uh, both McConnell and, and Hatch uh, are, are, are very pragmatic and uh, very experienced politicians. So I think they, they are, uh, are pursuing this, uh, this uh, high-stakes strategy in a way that uh, we'll still end up with uh, legislation by the middle of next year. Um, let, let's just be clear. I mean, Jeff is, of course, being perfectly accurate about the global nature of such side payments. And in the abstract, even as economists, you have large gains to the country as a whole from these trade deals, as well as foreign policy gains. And so it makes sense to buy off opposition. But let us just be very clear here. The tobacco carve out is not imperiling any other businesses. It is a very well defined carve out. And therefore, the idea that the interests of the U.S. should be sacrificed for the tobacco industry is wrong. And the pharmaceutical adjustment on its merits, as Carolyn Freund has argued, uh, is actually a reasonable compromise. The analogy I would use, which I think Carolyn would support, but I'll take responsibility for, is it's like base broadening in taxes. What's happening is instead of the U.S. maintaining very long patents and collecting a lot of revenues for pharmaceutical industry and the U innovation in the U.S. and having lots of cheating or non-recognition of those patents abroad, you're getting better enforcement across a wider range of markets abroad and reducing the length of those patents for some of the innovative medicines in the U.S., which, again, Carolyn has argued this, but I would think is a reasonable deal. And so to go back to Jeff's point, if Hatch and Senators Hatch and McConnell are pragmatic there should be a deal able to be made with a domestic adjustment that does not in any way interfere with the trade deal. Next question, please. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Councillor Chang from Korean Embassy. I have some questions of the, the implications of the Korea-China FTA into the CJK and RCEP and particularly TPP. The Jeff says that the uh, Korea-China FTA set the low bar or low expectations for the CJK or RCEP, while the Charles says that it might be a good starting point for the CJK and then RCEP can be expanded or upgraded. And I know that there's some internal debate in the states that uh, who write the international norms, that the U.S., the, the Obama administration says that the U.S. should, uh, should uh, uh, leading in, in writing the international trade norms. And I'm a little bit confused that whether the, if the, the Jeff's expectation that, that the CJK and RCEP's ex the expectation for the market access and then uh, rules area is not so high, ambitious. If so, the what is the U.S. concerns that the, why the U.S. have to lead the play, playing role in writing the trade norms? So, yeah, that is my question. Thank you. I, I, I think uh, the basic point is the U.S. does not uh, object uh, to any of these initiatives, regards them all as complementary to what the U.S. is doing in the TPP. Uh, and so do most other countries. In fact, almost half of the RCEP countries, if you include Korea, uh, 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 are engaged in the TPP. 
So those countries don't see any uh, uh, in, uh, inconsistency with pursuing both initiatives uh, uh, with different partners with different ambitions. Uh, I think uh, uh, what, what will be interesting being played out, and we haven't talked much about that uh, this morning, is how all of these initiatives will affect uh, efforts in APEC to move forward on a free trade area of the Asia Pacific. Right now, the United States and China are co-chairing a study in APEC that will be produced uh, in November of next year uh, to provide some recommendations on how to move forward with economic integration across the Asia Pacific. And uh, I think uh, it, uh, that study will be informed by what is happening in TPP. It will be informed by elements of the Korea-China agreement. It will be reform, uh, informed by progress on the RCEP. And there are some areas in RCEP that have gone beyond TPP with regard to economic cooperation. Uh, we're, uh, uh, anything that, that, that has a price tag on it uh, gets short, short shrift in US FTAs. Uh, but uh, there's a better understanding, I think, in Asia of the need to help promote infrastructure development and other means of, of technical and, and financial cooperation to ensure that countries are in a position to undertake and, and fully enforce uh, uh, commitments made in trade agreements. And so all of this will, will be insights that we brought to the table in figuring out what is happening, on, uh, what is possible on a free trade area of the Asia Pacific. And uh, I think that will move forward just as TPP moves forward with its expansion in the coming years. Thank you. Do we I, have a? I might oh, also please. just oh, add please to that. Please do, sure. um, On a more granular level, I'd also say, um, you know, with the the Korea, uh, the Korea-China FTA, you, know, you saw lack of willingness from Korea to liberalize agriculture. As a result, you saw exceptions, significant exceptions in autos. So perhaps, you know, and so that's kind of a low bar, a low precedent. Perhaps you could see in the CJK talks with Japan's participation that could sweeten the deal, provide additional leverage for more concessions in these, uh, you know, really important areas. On the other hand, you can also see that that low precedent means Japan won't budge um, either in agriculture and other areas as well. So you have kind of that two sides of the coin where it's unclear whether the precedent set in the Korea-China deal will mean you know, other countries stepping up to the plate um, to advance that deal. Um, so just to make that point. And also I'd be remiss if I didn't take advantage in terms of Barry's earlier question, um, you know, why would Korea join the TPP? Already has a chorus, uh, might be delayed. Um, well, we're also, Peterson Institute is also doing a comprehensive study on the TPP, um, an assessment that will cover all of the chapters and that a forthcoming study will show, uh, uh, will add to that question really, you know, how, to, how is TPP course plus, uh, w what areas aren't, um, and, and what areas incentivize other countries to participate, um, even given uh, previous FTAs with the US, how will it upgrade those FTAs? So I just wanted to take that opportunity no, to point absolutely. that out, um, as that will be a, a pretty big project moving forward. So no, stay on I the lookout. No, I appreciate Kathleen saying that, and just as on substance, on even more so on promotion, I will ramp up the forcefulness. Um, Kathleen and Jeff are leading our work on this. We are going to be releasing on a rolling basis various essays by our experts on specific pieces of the TPP, as well as comprehensive assessment. Uh, collecting these, these are meant to be a touchstone for the public debate and to be objective and highly informative. Um, among these, we are getting the latest update, as, as Kathleen is overseeing, from our colleague Peter Petrie, who has done the CGE analysis of the gains and distribution of gains from TPP, in part by industry and country. And that kind of modeling also gives you some sense of the amount of trade diversion and missed opportunities that Korea will have to face, assuming it stays out of TPP. So again, with thanks to Kathleen and Jeff and my many colleagues, there will be much more on that in coming weeks. One more question, please. Uh, Mark Tokola from the Korea Economic Institute. Um, as Chul mentioned, the agreement marks kind of a high watermark for China's FTAs. 
when you look at the agreement or China's negotiating objectives or what's achieved, does that tell you anything about China's view of its own economic reform or economic future? Maybe the balance between state enterprise versus private enterprise or between export-led growth or consumer growth or between China's developing economy or developed economy. What does it say about China's view of its own future? Well, that's a very good question. Uh, you have to look at it in a couple of different ways. Uh, a lot of China's, or most of China's agreements have been in the neighborhood. Uh, and they started with a, a very strong political objective and a less important economic objective. For example, the initial China-ASEAN uh, uh, negotiations. Uh, but uh, essentially, we are seeing now Chinese a greater uh, 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 harmonization of Chinese domestic strat uh, reform strategies with its approach to new international initiatives. That's why I mentioned they are more and more interested in doing international initiatives on investment. That's why the Chinese uh, have sought entry into the trade and in, in, in services agreement uh, uh, and uh, why they have expanded the scope of services uh, commitments made in particular uh, sectors of their bilateral agreements with New Zealand and others, uh, particularly in the area of education. Uh, and uh, so we're seeing a very uh, measured and incremental improvement in the, their standards of their, uh, of their uh, uh, commitments in, in FTAs. Uh, Chul made this point as well. Uh, uh, but uh, it's, uh, I think, a little different from what they are, are, are looking for in terms of the plurilaterals. And, I, and I, would, I would argue that the plurilaterals will be much more of a driving force for uh, Chinese economic reform in the near term than these uh, bilaterals. Great. We have time for one last question, please. Panga uh, with Xinhua Liu Agency. I just want to follow up with this question. I'm wondering, judging from the career, China FTA, how do you think, uh, how big the gap is between China's trade practice uh, and the high standard in the TPP? Thanks. Well, that's, uh, that's uh, something that uh, we will be able to uh, 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 discuss in much more detail uh, as we complete our assessment of the TPP chapters, uh, because you can't just take the summaries that are that governments issue and say this is what's in the agreement. Uh, there are, are a lot of important nuances, some important exceptions, some important new innovations in the TPP that have to be looked at. Uh, right now, I would say, just on, on a broad general level. Uh, that the expectations, or at least the hopes, were that the Korea-China deal would narrow the gap between TPP standards or international best practice and China's uh, current practice. And uh, in many areas, I don't think it made an appreciable difference. Thank you. That was a very clear, solid response. Uh, which all our best detailed analysis, which is indeed worth our doing and everyone reading, is still unlikely to change very much. Uh, thank you all for joining us on this pre-holiday morning. Thanks especially to Jin, to Kathleen, and to Jeff for doing this thorough work. Thanks to Chul and our colleagues from KIAP for engaging with us on this project. And I look forward to seeing you all back here at the Institute early in the new year. This meeting is adjourned.